Good morning, Saints. A few more empty seats in church this morning than normal, I suspect. Some of the faithful are at home, tired, sad, licking their wounds after another Leafs defeat. Enough of that stupidity, let's move on. Acts chapter 28, let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that by the power of your spirit through your word, we see ourselves as we truly are, sinners in need of a Savior, and we see you for who you truly are in Jesus, the God who does not crush rebels, the God who does not kill rebels, but dies for them and in their place. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love to us in Jesus. Would you, this morning by your Spirit, lead us into all truth and encourage our spirits and our souls. We pray this in your name. Amen. This morning, I want us to move through the text that Vic read. Um, we're going to move through it first, and then we're going to apply it. Okay, you with me so far? We're going to look at the details of this passage, almost verse by verse, and then at the end, we're going to draw out one big point. Another way to think about that, we are going to start by looking at what this text meant as the narrative unfolded and to the original audience, that's where we're going to start. Have you ever considered just that? That in the scriptures, we have a compilation of 66 different books that were recorded and written with authorial intent. Do you know what I mean by authorial intent? So contrary to what you're going to learn in the humanities departments and universities these days, um, when authors sat down to write something, they had a particular idea in mind. You don't get to determine what they were saying, they get to determine what they were saying. When we come to scripture, we read the intent of the author, the author who is none other than the Lord God himself. We believe that the Holy Spirit moved men to write and directed, and so when we read a passage like this, we have to start by saying, what did the text mean to its original audience? In one sense, that is what establishes the guardrails as we process meaning. Okay, so you, you start by saying, what did this narrative mean as it unfolded? What did it mean to the original audience when Luke set parchment, uh, pe stylus to parchment, and the Holy Spirit carried him along and directed what he would write on this account? What did it mean to them? Because any passage in Scripture that we read today cannot mean something that it didn't mean to the original audience. So that's where we're going to start. Let's begin there. What does this mean? Well, look at verses 1 to 2. This is Paul's arrival in Malta. At this point in the narrative, Paul and his companions, who if you remember includes Luke, who's the author of this, who's writing it, they've been wrecked on a reef after two weeks at sea. Just a few verses ago, at the end of chapter 27, verses 43 to 44, we're told that on this shipwreck, some of those who were on board, when this ship came up on the reef and then was being battered against the reef and torn to, to pieces, some of them swam to shore. And those who were not able to swim, they floated into shore on planks and debris. That's chapter 27, verses 43 to 44. It's a remarkable thing that after this shipwreck, all 276 souls on board were saved. In one sense, it is actually a remarkable thing that so many people were saved. In another sense, you had to know that that was going to be the case because Paul prophesied that that would happen, that everyone would be saved. So we come to verse 1. After we were brought safely through... We then learned that the island was called Malta. So all of these guys, you got to picture the scene. Big storm, shipwrecked on the reef. Some of them made a swim for it and got into shore. Others were like, I don't know, like the movie Titanic, clinging to debris and floated into shore. 
Shortly after getting on the shore, they discovered that it was Malta on which they stood. Now, Danny, did we get a map in for this morning? If we do, can you put it up behind me? Good, thanks. I got my fancy little pointer. You guys impressed? Awesome. Okay. So this actually shows you Paul's journey uh, to Rome. We read about him going through these parts uh, over the last couple of weeks. The lee side of Crete. Do you remember that? And Fair Havens. And then this week he comes to the island of Malta. Okay, now no lying. Remember you're in church. Who here knew where Malta was before that map? A few? Yeah, I know Anthony Demek knew. His family is from there. Right, Anthony? Uh, I have to be honest with you. I knew the general vicinity, but I didn't know exactly where it was. It's this small island just south of Sicily. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So That's where Paul and the 276 wash up on shore. Verse 2, we're told that they were welcomed by natives. Verse 2, the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. Literally, in the original Greek, they were welcomed by barburi, barbarians, natives. Now, barbarian was the Greek word that was used in the Roman Empire to describe anyone who was non-Greek. And so what you have to picture here is an island of Malta that is populated exclusively by natives who were not Greek by ethnicity and they were not Greek speakers. This crew of 276 rescuees were cold, wet, and pathetic. And we're told that they received unusual kindness and welcome. Why do you suppose it was that this was unexpected? I think this kindness was unexpected because these were, after all, barbarians. Raises a timely question for us this morning. Here's the question. If barbarians in 60-something A.D. on the island of Malta can show unusual kindness and welcome, here's the question. Can men be good without God? That's the question. Well, in one sense, the answer to that question is yes, and in another sense, it's no. Let's consider both for a moment. First of all, can men be good without God? Well, in one sense, yes, they can. Have you ever found yourself on the receiving end of kindness? Found yourself interacting with people who demonstrate a godly virtue and character, even though they do not profess the name of Christ? How is that? Well, Christians believe that God created everything. And that because God created everything, including human beings, that there remain vestiges of his character his goodness, his kindness, his mercy, his beauty, all of those vestiges of God's character are still to be found everywhere around us. And they're obvious to anyone who's looking, Christian or not. Christians believe that even God's moral law and his code is written into the very fabric of the cosmos. I say it a different way, because God created, and his creation is in some sense an expression of his character, there is enough of the character of God generally revealed that a man or woman could still affirm and aim towards good, even though they're not born again. You see it all the time. In fact, scripture would push it even further. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, would say not only is there enough of God's general character revealed in the cosmos that you can aim towards good, Paul would say there is so much of God's character and nature revealed in the cosmos that every single person is without excuse. They've seen enough to know that there is a God, even if they haven't heard the gospel. Well, that explains why most world religions agree on issues of moral law. Have you ever noticed that? Even apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, other world religions would tell you that 
murder is wrong and stealing and lying. You know, go through the list. There is this common agreement among all world religions, most world religions, of moral law and virtue. It's because there are vestiges of the character of God written throughout the cosmos. So in one sense, yes, men can be, air quotes, good without God. The natives on Malta were unusually kind to these shipwrecked men. But in a deeper sense, the answer to the question is no. So a life without Christ can still be morally good. That's the nature of general revelation. This moral code of God is in a deep sense written into the heart of every single person. That's why people who aren't even Christians know right from wrong, whether they choose to follow it or not. But the truth is that apart from Christ, no one can will the good. Let me say that differently. You may be able to point your life and aim towards good in general, but apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, no one can be saved. Being morally good is going to give you a better life. It's going to make you a better person. It's going to make you a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better mother. Being morally good apart from Christ, you can still be a better employer, a better employee. You can be a better neighbor and you can be a better friend. But you can never be saved. More pointedly, even the natives on Malta, kind though they were, remained unregenerate objects of divine wrath and needed to be saved. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Well, the same is true today. And you know, you, you got to be really aware of this, because if not, there are so many factors and forces in the world that will um, reduce being saved to just moralism. And it will lull you into a false sense of comfort. If you ever believe that just being good enough can save you before a holy God, you can get lulled to sleep both for yourself and for your neighbors. You, you fall into this trap of what Scripture says, declaring peace, peace, where there is no peace. Let's make this really pointed this morning. Even so-called good people need to be saved. Not saved by their own virtue, but by God's in Christ. That's the gospel. Have you ever been saved? Look, I know that on a Sunday morning, I'm speaking to people who are morally good, right? Or at least better than average. Most of us come from an upper middle class home, at least. We present ourselves as good people to ourselves and to others. But the shocking, disarming, scandalous truth to all good people, to all people who feel as though they have their bank accounts filled with moral currency, the shocking truth is you still need to repent. You still need to trust in Jesus and be saved. Can you be good without God? Well, you can be moral, but you can never be saved. That's verses 1 to 2. Look at verses 3 to 6. So in verses 3 to 6, verse 3, Paul lends a hand in gathering sticks for the fire. I actually love that. In a world where too many pastors buy into the cult of celebrity, no task is too menial for St. Paul. 
shipwrecked, walked up, washed up on the shore. He rolls up his sleeves and gathers sticks just like everyone else. It tells us in verse 3 that a viper comes alive from the warmth of the flames and latches onto his hand. Verse 4, the natives collectively think two things. Do you see it there? The first thing that they think is, well, that's the end for this guy. <laughs> right? That's it. You got a picture, right? Paul's picking up these sticks and he's helping out. And then all of a sudden, he probably jumped back at the start of being bit, and there's a viper hanging from his hand. And the natives of Malta are like, well, this guy's goose is cooked. It's over. Now, I was reading some commentators over this week, and they present problems with this. And I think it's because they read it so closely that they miss the obvious. Some commentators say, well, clearly Paul survived this venomous snake attack because the locals were wrong. It wasn't a viper. It wasn't a venomous snake. It must have been some kind of harmless snake. But we all know that that's not true. First of all, God, throughout the book of Acts, performs things that are supernatural, things that are miracles. Secondly, you just know it as an obvious truth. Natives know better than anyone else what fruits, flowers, frogs, snakes are venomous and poisonous, right? And so if these guys collectively looked at the snake hanging off of Paul and they were like, well, he's done, it must have been a viper, venomous. They looked and decided that the jig was up for this prisoner. That's the first thing that they collectively said. The second thing they collectively said was, it's a little bit more nuanced, but it's there, okay? And I want to unpack this. They drew a conclusion that was based on how they believe that the world works. They drew a conclusion based on how they believe that the gods work. Their worldview is implied in this encounter, and their worldview was a type of karma. Do you know what I mean by karma? You get what you deserve. Here's how their logic went. They were standing on the seashore. They welcomed these guys. They are helping them to make a fire. Paul bit by a viper. They see it. And they think this shipwrecked prisoner was on his way to trial. He's washed up on our land. A venomous viper bit him. He's surely going to die. Therefore, he has been judged and found guilty. See, that was the worldview of the natives on the island of Malta. They believed fundamentally that everyone gets what they deserve. Over the centuries, there have been archaeological digs on the island of Malta that has uncovered and pieced together the history of the island at that time. The natives back then worshipped a god called Nemesis. And Nemesis was a god who gave people justice. You got what you deserved. But you know, here we are in 2024 in northeast Burlington, and because of the myth of progress, we believe that these people were so primitive and we're so smart, right? The problem is that this God nemesis remains the default setting for most people today unawares. This God nemesis, you know, you get what you deserve. It, even for some people, becomes a functionally good way to map meaning in the world. Why do bad things happen? Well, the person must have deserved it. Why do good things happen? Well, I guess they deserved it too. This idea of our projection of justice. Now, in one sense, we all want justice and long for it. Especially when you see something that's overtly wicked. It's kind of the only way that I can sleep at night. Knowing that in the end, the wicked are going to get theirs. But what about in the minor things? 
when somebody wrongs you. We, by default, revert back to this nemesis worship, this um, karmic cycle and view of the world. Somebody wrongs you, somebody cuts you off in traffic, you kind of hope that they race off and rear-end someone. If somebody wrongs you, you have this sense of schadenfreude, right? When they, something bad happens to them and you're like Nelson on The Simpsons, you're like, ha ha. It's this karmic worldview. Now, in some cases, this is a perverted thing, but in other ways, it's more understandable. Sometimes um, something bad happens to someone else, and you, in, you take joy or pleasure in their pain. That's perverted and sick. We all do it. That's why fail reels are so popular on Instagram. Um, but in a second category, we enjoy when bad things happen to other people because we say, oh, it's justice. They deserve it. Something bad happens to someone you know. And the only way that you can conscience it is to say, well, they did something to deserve that. And the reason that you do that is so that you can distance yourself from their suffering and say, well, they did something to deserve that. I haven't done that thing. Therefore, that bad thing is not going to happen to me. It's one of the reasons why when people go to a funeral, they always ask, so how did the person die? <laughs> They're like, good thing I'm not doing that. I guess I'm not going to die. Well, there's so many different problems with this karmic worldview that was dominant not only with the natives back in Malta, but even today. The first thing is it's not how things truly work, and the second thing that's wrong with it is it's not the gospel. Let me tell you what I mean. First of all, it's not how things work. In life and in Scripture, it would often seem that the wicked get ahead while the just find themselves under hardship. Have you encountered that in your own life? Have you encountered that in Scripture? So many times in the book of Psalms, the psalmist cries out to God, and says, why is it that the wicked seem to get ahead? They're not getting what they deserve. Why is it that the just are being faced with hardship and challenge and difficulty? And the psalmist cries out and says, how long, O Lord? You see, a karmic view of the world, first of all, is just not true. The biblical answer is, well... Jesus said, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, but there will be a reckoning in the end. So the first problem with the karmic worldview is it's not how things work. The second problem is it's not how the gospel works. You see, the gospel is the anti-karma. You and I often want other people to get their comeuppance, to get what they deserve, but if we're truly honest with ourselves, we sure don't want what we deserve. And in Christ, the beauty of this precious gospel is that on the cross, Jesus took what you deserved. He died the death that was yours so that in exchange, you are given all that he deserves. Let me say it a different way. He took the penalty for your sin in his body and in his death, and he gives you the perfect righteousness that is his. It's the anti-karma. We no longer live under this curse of a karmic cycle. That we don't get what we deserve, but we get what the Lord Jesus Christ deserves. He took what we deserve. Now, this is um, such a dominant narrative. It's this narrative of karma. 
right, this false narrative, that we, even as Christians, have to engage constantly in identifying it when it comes up and displacing it with the truth of the gospel. You are never more like Jesus than when you repay good for evil. When you have someone dead to rights, you have them painted into the corner, and they deserve it with both barrels, and you extend grace to them. You are living into and living out of the beauty of the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. The anti-karma. Not giving what someone deserves, but because God has so lavished his grace on you when you didn't deserve it then you can't help but be gracious to others. The more you realize the greatness of your salvation in Christ, the more gracious you'll be. Look at these natives on Malta. They were possessed with a default worldview that needed to be corrected by the gospel. Same for us. All right, that's verses 3 to 6. Look at verses, sorry, that's verses 3 to 4. Look at verses 5 to 6. So the snake is, having been bitten, Paul, it now falls off. And these natives are watching Paul. They're, you know, maybe sitting back, eating popcorn, waiting for the show. They want him to swell up and die. Verse 6, they're shocked to see that he's fine. They waited, they waited. And what was their conclusion? You see it there in verse 6? Yeah, they're like, oh, this guy, he must be a god. Isn't that a funny turn in the narrative? So they don't conclude that he was innocent. They conclude that he must be divine. You know, it's such an interesting side note to me, like, because on human nature and behavior, it's the case for us too. When we live out of a karmic false worldview, We look at other people when they're suffering and we heap guilt on top of them. We're like, well, you deserved it. But if they are unexpectedly delivered from suffering, we don't look at it and say, oh, you must be innocent. We look at it and you say, well, you sure dodged a bullet there, right? You didn't get what you deserved, but you should have got it. We don't conclude that people are innocent. This is part of the flawed logic of our fallen nature. All right, back to the text. Several times throughout Acts, Paul has been mistaken by the crowds for a god. Each time he corrects them. And so, assumed right in this text is that he set the natives of Malta straight here too. And this must have come as such a surprise to these natives on Malta. That Paul was neither a murderer nor a god. So what defines him? He's neither a murderer nor a god. Those are the only two categories that they had for him. Instead, he is a model and a type for all Christians who come after him. Here's what I mean. We could all compile lists of both virtues and vices in our own lives. We could all put together times when we deserved death and other glorious moments when we triumphed over sin. But in Christ, we are defined by neither. We are neither convict nor God, but rather we are sinners made saints by God in Christ. That's who Paul was, and that's who you are. They claimed at first that he was a murderer, then they claimed that he was a god, when in fact, Paul is just like every one of us, a sinner made saint by God in Jesus. Okay, verses 7 to 10, we're introduced to this chief man on the island. His name is Publius. Like the natives on the island, he extends warm hospitality to the shipwrecked prisoners for at least three days. His father, Publius's father, falls sick. 
They call for Paul, and Paul lays hands on him, and Publius' father is healed. So word gets around the island, and all of a sudden, the natives begin to bring all of their sick friends and family to Paul. And Paul prays for them, and they're all healed too. Verse 10. The natives then restocked the ship. Well, presumably another ship, right? Because that ship was wrecked on the reef. And they sent Paul and the 276 on their way to Rome. I'm going to pick that up in a moment. Very quickly, verses 11 to 17, back to our little map. Put it up. Verse 11, three months stay in Malta. Um, Preaching, no doubt, because that's what Paul did. Verses 12 to 14, he moves up to Syracuse, and then Regium, and then up to Puteoli, which is sort of close to Naples, modern-day Naples. And then from there, he goes inland to Rome. Now, when he's in Rome, we're told that he meets with some of the local Christians who are already in Rome. When you were reading that, did you ever wonder, how did the gospel get to Rome before Paul? I thought Paul was the guy who took the gospel all throughout the world on his three missionary journeys. Well, it's not explicit, but it's hinted at in the text. Back in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, we're told that Jews came from all over the empire and converged on Jerusalem on that first Pentecost. They then heard the gospel preached in their various tongues and traveled back home. So these were probably Jewish converts to Christianity from that very first sermon in Acts chapter 2. Paul is encouraged and strengthened in the fellowship. Verse 16, he's still in chains, but he's encouraged. Okay, friends, that's the passage. That's what it says and what it meant to the original audience. I want to close with this, briefly, what it means for us today. In one sense, you can read this account in Acts chapter 28, verses 1 to 16, as the tale of two cities. You have Paul in Malta, and you have Paul in Rome. And there's something instructive and normative for us to glean from this. It applies to us today in the West. It's a timeless truth put on display. Paul arrived in Malta, and we meet this man named Publius. Now, it's not explicit in the Bible, but if we go to extra-biblical history, we know that Publius not only heard the gospel from Paul, But he repented, he believed, and he was saved. How do we know this? Well, this man, Publius, became the very first pastor on the island of Malta. So radical was the gospel influence of Paul and this lasting influence of this first pastor named Publius that the church established there on that island of Paul's shipwreck endures to this day. On the island of Malta, um, this small spit of land out in the middle of the Mediterranean, not particularly close to anything, it was populated by natives at the time of the New Testament, around 60 AD. They receive Paul, they receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are converted en masse, Sometime in the 9th century, the siege of Melit takes place on Malta, where Muslim marauders from North Africa sail up to this small island and seize the island. The island of Malta remains under Islamic rule until it's liberated by the French, and liberated we should put in air quotes. Napoleon was on his way to Egypt to take over that empire, symbolically important. And on his way to Egypt, he sent word ahead to Malta that he would like safe passage for his ships, he'd like to come into the harbor, and he'd like to be restocked. 
Instead, he came into the harbor and bombed the hell out of them. <laughs> and, he, and he conquered the island of Malta for France. And so France then ruled on the island of Malta until the 1800s when a man by the name of Admiral Lord Nelson put in a blockade around the island of Malta and captured that island from the French for the British. Then in 1964, the island of Malta gained its independence from the British. And you're probably thinking, that's great, R.D., but why the history lesson on Malta? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's where it is. Did you know that the island of Malta stands today as one of the most Christian countries in the world per capita? 88% of the population of Malta is in church on Sunday morning. Here, here, here's what I want you to see. This is the point. The church of Jesus Christ established through a perilous shipwreck of Paul, the preaching of the good news of Jesus on an island of unusually kind natives, endures to this day. So Paul leaves, right? He, he packs up, he goes on to Rome, he's made his way inland to the center of the empire with this same gospel message. But the Roman Empire will fall. I'm reading H.G. Wells' outline of human history right now where he recounts some of the reasons why the Roman Empire fought, fell. He says that one of the chief reasons is that the Roman Empire was held together by a high view of clearly defined Roman citizenship, its rights and responsibilities. As the Roman Empire began to stretch out further and further, there were so many people brought into the Roman Empire that citizenship lost its definition and lost its cherished status. And then the Roman Empire just collapsed from within. If that sounds um, you know, too close to home, that's probably because it is. The Roman Empire is going to collapse. But the church of Jesus Christ remains. And it will remain until Jesus returns for his bride. Remember when Jesus told Peter, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Here, here's the one big point that I want you to take away today. We live in a tempestuous time in the West. All signs would indicate that the empire that we've lived in, that we've enjoyed since the end of World War II, is either coming to an end or already in its death throes. There is a sense of devalued citizenship. But look at what happened in Malta and in Rome. And remember this. Find peace and courage in this. Your passport may be Canadian. And Canada may, like Rome, fall. But your citizenship is in heaven. You have an eternal reward in the gospel that is kept for you and you are kept for it. Rome fell. But the witness of the gospel, the church in Malta, the church in Burlington will endure till the end. Take heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray that you would continue to shape and form us into the very image of Christ. That our lives would be so saturated by the truth of your unmerited love for us in Jesus that it would make us gracious as well. That our hope would not be in earthly things, in empires that will crumble and fall, but that our hope would be in the Lord Jesus Christ, whose church will stand against the gates of hell. 
pray this in your name. Amen.